What's up, what's up, New Hope Church? Hope you are doing well during this summer of 2017. I'm doing well, as most of you know, but if you're a guest, you might not know. I am on a three-month sabbatical, and I miss you folks dearly, but our family is doing great. We've dropped Wesley off at the Citadel in Charleston, and uh, Benjamin is getting ready to go to the University of South Carolina. And on top of that, I just miss you, church. I miss you dearly and I can't wait to be back with you the Sunday after Labor Day. But I did wanna tell you about our guest speaker, preacher of the gospel today. I met Pastor Mike Kelsey about three years ago as I was engaged in a multi-site round table where we would meet in different cities around the country. And I met with about 15 to 20 pastors who led multi-site churches and listen to me New Hope, I knew immediately that this was a brother that I wanted to connect with. We just had a kindred spirit. And as you will see today, there's just something about Mike Kelsey. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He is from the DC metropolitan area and is a pastor at the historic McLean Bible Church. He was born into a strong lineage of Washington, D.C. pastors that includes both his father and his grandfather. Pastor Mike grew up with a strong foundation in the gospel. And by God's grace, he fully surrendered himself to Christ as a student at the University of Maryland College Park. After receiving his Bachelor of Arts in Rhetoric and Political Culture in 2004, Mike went into full-time ministry, helping to organize evangelistic festivals in major cities around the United States of America, and eventually accepted the call to join the pastoral staff at McLean Bible Church in 2007. He has a passion, and listen to this church, this is why I believe I was so drawn to him. This is why I think you're gonna connect with him today. He has a passion, like we do to advance the gospel in multi-ethnic contexts and longs to see the emerging generation invest their lives for the glory of God. He is married to his college sweetheart, Ashley, and they have three young children. I'm telling you, church, you are in for a treat today. I want you to do what you always do. I want you to give it up and welcome Pastor Mike Kelsey to the stage as he brings forth the Word of God today. What's up, New Hope? Thank you, thank you. It's good to be here uh, with you today. Uh, good to be with those of you out at the campuses watching online. Uh, it's, it's cool. We're a multi-site church, McLean Bible Church in the D.C. metro area. And so I know just the great privilege we have through technology to all link together around God's word. And so glad uh, that you're here. I, I, I love Pastor Benji. Like you mentioned, we, uh, we met and my first thought was, is this dude always this happy? Like, how is he so relentlessly optimistic? I don't understand it. Um, but uh, yeah, he's in Southern California. We talked yesterday uh, with his son, just enjoying that time. And uh, so we're going to be in Mark uh, chapter 5. And so if you got uh, your Bible with you, you can go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 5. That's where we're going to be uh, today. And uh, my wife and I are in a new season of life. And uh, so I've been on staff at our church for about 10 years and she was on staff for about 11 years. About a year ago, when we found out we were pregnant with our third, she decided to stay home full time. That was a big decision, a major transition for her being in full time uh, vocational ministry for 11 years. And we are used to kind of doing it together, going to the office together, leaving, going and pick up the kids, all of that. And so it's a different rhythm for us as a family now. And so she's at home uh, primarily uh, during the day uh, with our kids and then picking them up. And then uh, my son, we call him Cray Cray. He's probably lighting something on fire. That means crazy. Uh, we, that's not his name. Uh, uh, he's probably lighting stuff on fire or whatever. And so she's stressed out, overwhelmed. She's waiting for me to come home and give her some relief. And inevitably, she gets the dreaded text message. I'm running late. I'm running late. And she's frustrated. And so I know she's frustrated, but I want you to just imagine this for a second, right? Uh, imagine a young boy, 
A young boy who's waiting for his father to come pick him. Doesn't live with his dad, lives with his mom. Some of y'all can resonate with this. Lives with his mom. Dad says, hey, I'm picking you up. We're going to the movies at 5. I'm coming to get you at 4. He's waiting at the window. He's got his back. He's ready to see his dad. He's looking out the window, just super excited. 405 rolls around. He gets the message that his dad is running late. So he's a little bit disappointed, but he's still excited. And then 430 rolls around, and his dad still isn't there, there yet. So he's getting a little bit nervous because this has happened before. And he's wondering, is he going to show up? But he's still hopeful. Five o'clock comes around, and that little boy is still sitting at that window waiting for his dad, growing frustrated that his father has let him down again. Some of y'all don't have to imagine that scenario. You've lived that situation over and over again. And here's what I know. I know that there's many people who feel that way in your relationship with God. Where you feel like you are constantly waiting on God. There's plans that you have for your life. There's dreams and desires that you have. And you've submitted them to God. And you feel like God is running late in your life? Have you ever felt like God was running late? Have you ever felt like time was getting away from you? I know I've felt that way before. Maybe for you it's a personal challenge in your life. Maybe it's a philosophical challenge where you're wondering, you look at the suffering in this world and you wonder, God, how could you possibly be real and how could you possibly be present? Listen, if we're honest, there are realities in life that cause us to question the timing, the wisdom, and the power of God. So in Mark chapter 5, we meet a man named Jairus who learned firsthand a lesson that we need to learn, especially where we're in a season where God is making us wait and we don't quite understand what he's doing. So we're going to dig into Mark chapter 5. Let me pray for us real quick and we'll get in here. Father, we come to you and we sit under the authority of your word, God. As James says, we receive your word with humility. We do not critique your word, standing over it as its authority. We sit under your word because your word is the authority, Lord God. And so we pray that you would speak to our hearts personally today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's pick up this story. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. It says, And when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. And then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came. Now pause there for a second. If you're new to the Bible or, or you may not understand who Jairus is, what a synagogue ruler is, let me explain. J J uh, Jairus is one of the local synagogue leaders there in Capernaum. And this is an extremely prominent religious position, not just religious, but even a, a, a prominent political position in this Jewish community. And here's why that's important. It's important because the Jews at this time were extremely hostile toward Jesus. They didn't rock with Jesus at all. In fact, in John chapter 9, it says that if anyone in the synagogue confesses faith in Jesus, they will be kicked out of the synagogue. That means they will be estranged from their religious and social and cultural community. It was a big deal. And so what's about to happen in this story is not just unusual, but it's dangerous. Look at what it says. It says, and when Jairus saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with Jesus saying, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. Listen, this is treason, y'all. This is treason. This is, he's a Jewish synagogue ruler, and he's coming to this heretic, Jesus, and he's falling down and bowing down at his feet. This is an American soldier switching over to ISIS. This is Kevin Durant going to Golden State, right? <laughs> this is problematic. So why would he do it? Why would he do it? But here's why, because he's desperate. His baby girl is 12. She's 12 years old. Luke adds that this is Jairus' only child. And so no matter what he had been told about Jesus, no matter what his family and friends had said about Jesus, no matter what he had previously believed about Jesus, he now knew that he desperately needed the power of God. 
Either God was going to move or his little girl was going to die. And so he knew Jesus had done miracles before, and he comes to Jesus, and he begs Jesus to heal his dying daughter. And the story continues, verse 24. It says, so Jesus went with him, and a large crowd followed and pressed around him. I want you to think about an ambulance, right, rushing through, rushing through rush hour traffic, trying to get a little girl to, to the hospital. They're just trying to work their way through. They're honking the horn. Sirens are, are blaring. They're tr- trying. This is Jesus and Jairus. They are pressing through this crowd, trying to get to this dying little girl. And then Jesus gets interrupted. He gets interrupted. Look at verse 25. It says, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Now, now we're not specifically told uh, what was causing this, but we know it's a chronic condition. It says she's been dealing with it for 12 years. That's a long time. And, And that would be bad enough But she's not only struggling with her help, it's been so long now that she's also struggling with her hope. And it's not like she hasn't been trying. It's not like she's lazy and she hasn't been trying to overcome this. Look at verse 26. It says, she has suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and has spent all the money she had, yet instead of getting better, she only grew worse. Listen, some of y'all know what this feels like if you struggle with chronic illness or you have a loved one who struggles with chronic illness day in and day out, cancer, migraines, back pain, a child with disabilities. You understand what this woman would have been feeling. Being sick or in pain is one thing, but when there's no end in sight, it can feel like physical and emotional torture. In fact, I was reading this uh, medical journal They said it's estimated that up to one-third of people with a serious medical condition have symptoms of depression. They say a a chronic illness can make it impossible to do the things you enjoy, and it can eat away at your self-confidence. And listen, a chronic illness can eat away at your sense of hope in the future. While everybody else is going on with their life, you can feel completely alone in your pain. And maybe you felt that way before. Like no matter how hard you try, nothing seems to be working. It only seems to be getting worse. This woman had been suffering for 12 years. In verse 27, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd. Nothing else had worked. No other doctors could figure it out. She came up behind him. And listen, if you understand this culture, first century culture here, what she does next should make you extremely nervous. This woman comes up behind Jesus, and the old versions say she touched the hem of his garment. She touched the bottom of his cloak. Now, why is this a big deal? Because in this culture, because she had this condition, she would have been viewed as ceremonially unclean. What does that mean? All it means, unclean means she was unqualified to be in the presence of God. And so she wasn't allowed to go into the synagogue. She wasn't allowed to participate in the Jewish rituals and festivals. She couldn't go into people's homes. You can read about this more in Leviticus chapter 15. It says, any bed she lies in, that shall be unclean. And anything she sits on, that shall be unclean. And anyone who touches those things will be unclean. So not only was it illegal for people to touch her, it, would have, it was illegal for people to touch anything that she touched. So she is extremely isolated and she's embarrassed and she feels shame. And then look what happens. Listen, listen she, she touches this. Why would she do this? Why would she risk this? For the same reason that a hostile Jewish synagogue ruler was because she desperately needed the power of God. Verse 28 says, she thought, if I could just touch his clothes, I would be healed. And immediately, there was no, there, there, immediately, immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him and he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? And the disciples answered, you see the people crowding against you and yet you ask who touched me? In other words, the disciples are like, Jesus, the crowds are pressing around you. Who touched you? Everybody touched you, okay? (laughs) Like they're all touching you, Jesus. 
But Jesus kept looking around, verse 32, to see who had done it. And then the woman, knowing what happened to her, came and just like Jairus, she fell at his feet and trembling with fear, she told Jesus the whole truth. Listen, I'm sure she wanted to stay anonymous. I'm sure she wanted to slip out of the crowd unnoticed. She didn't want to draw attention to herself, just like so many people do when you come to church. You want to slip out the back door. You don't want to fill out a first-time card, nothing, right? You, you're new to church, or you're wondering, you feel shame. You don't, you don't understand this whole religious thing, and you just kind of want to come in and, and hear about God and, and, and roll out. I understand this is how this woman felt, but Jesus calls her out. And here's why, because Jesus wanted her to be known. And Jesus wanted her to know that she is known. And you imagine what she would have been feeling. Unclean. Nobody can touch her. Nobody can touch what she touches. Isolated. Worried. Worried that she was going to be condemned by this popular Jewish miracle uh, miracle working uh, rabbi. And look at how Jesus responds to her, verse 34. He doesn't say, you unclean woman. He says, daughter, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Listen, Jesus wanted her to know that what she had experienced, it wasn't magic. It wasn't superstition. It wasn't your grandma's religion. She had been healed because of her faith in Jesus. Because of her faith, her personal faith in Jesus. And listen, this is an amazing illustration of the gospel, of the gospel of Jesus. Because listen, according to Levitical law, first of all, she would have had to wait until somehow the bleeding stopped. And then she would have had to find a priest who would offer a sacrifice on her behalf. And then and only then would she be admitted back into Jewish society. And even the priest, the holiest person in this community, the priest couldn't touch her because he would be made unclean too. But it's the opposite with Jesus, the great high priest. Listen, Jesus touches what is unclean and he makes it clean. He makes it clean. This is the gospel, 2 Corinthians 5.21, that God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us so that through him we might become the righteousness of God. He comes into our lives. We are unclean. We are unqualified to be in the presence of God. He came and he died on the cross. He was separated from the presence of God and rose from the grave so that we could be made clean. Through Jesus, we could be made qualified to be in the presence of God. This is the gospel and this is good news. This is good news. Now, this is amazing. This is some good gospel glory in this passage. This is good news for us. It's good news for this woman. But have y'all forgot about our boy Jairus? Because Jairus is watching this whole thing go down. And I know he's like, Jesus, can we talk for, can we talk for a second? Like, I'm happy for her. But she had this for 12 years. A couple hours ain't going to kill her. My daughter is dying, Jesus. And some of y'all know what that feels like, right? Maybe, maybe right now God has you in a season where he's making you wait. And he's, and, and he's making you wait while you watch him work in other people's lives. And, and the dreams and the desires and the plans that you have for your life and for your family and for, for your career and for, for what you want to do. And, and these dreams aren't, aren't maybe even selfish dreams. They're dreams that you have to bring God glory. He's making you wait while you watch him work in other people's lives. And listen, I know this had to be frustrating for Jairus. I want you to think about it. Jesus sparks up a conversation with this woman. Verse 33, it says, she tells him the whole truth. She told him the whole story about her life. I know Jairus is like, I want to condense this a little bit. Just give me the tweetable version of this story. <laughs> Ever interacted with those people who don't know how to take social cues? They're trying to tell you every, every detail. You're trying to roll, you're trying to leave in the lobby after service. It's going to happen to you today. 
you, you're trying to give them cues, right? You're trying to give them one word answers so they don't continue. You're trying to slowly back away and they just come in your direction. You get it, right? Jairus is like, lady, wrap it up. <laughs> Listen, he's desperate. And the son of God is making him wait. And while he's waiting, the worst words a parent could ever hear. I want you to imagine sitting in the waiting room while your little girl is in the emergency room. The doctor comes out in verse 35 while Jesus was still speaking to the woman. Some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and they said, your daughter is dead. They said, why bother the teacher anymore? So you got to remember that Jairus had just seen this woman be healed. And so here's what he knows. He knows that Jesus is able to heal his daughter, but for some reason he didn't. He has the power over sickness, but he dragged his feet. He got distracted. He forgot about Jairus. This is what Jairus is is feeling. I remember remember racing to the hospital July 30 of 2009. And a couple months prior to that, one of me and my wife's best friends, Jess, she got married. I remember getting a phone call. I've met someone. I'm like, who is this dude? I want to meet him, right? And I'm excited. She she meets somebody, whatever. They they, kind of get to know each other and all of that. And they end up getting married. My wife, she sings at their wedding, Jerron cool guy. Two months later, I'm sitting on my couch about nine o'clock at night and I get a phone call and it's Jess and we haven't talked in a while. I want to give her space, like get settled in, newlywed life and I'm excited to hear how things been going. And I pick up the phone and a little bit of small talk and I never forget two words. Jerron died. Jerron died. I remember hitting me like a Mack truck. What do you mean, Jerron died? I remember grabbing my wife, and we hopped in the car, and we rushed to the hospital. I remember in the car, on the way to the hospital, pleading with God, God, you got to heal him. I know they're saying he's dead, but maybe he's not. Heal him, and even if he is dead, God, you are the God who can raise the dead. I need you to work. And we got to the hospital, and God didn't do it. Jerron died. Listen. That'll mess with your faith. It'll mess with your faith when you are waiting and you are trusting with God. Based on his word, you're trusting him, and it seems like he does not come through for you. And this is the temptation that Jairus is facing. These messengers say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher anymore? Jesus didn't intervene in the way you thought he would, so why keep setting yourself up for disappointment, Jairus? I love it. Verse 36 says, overhearing what they said, Jesus said to Jairus, and some of y'all need to get this, don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be afraid by what you see, just believe. And so they start walking. And you can imagine what Jairus is feeling on this walk. He's walking beside Jesus in his heart. He's growing frustrated. He's probably angry at Jesus. He's wrestling with anxiety and depression and grief and being overwhelmed and despair and anger. It's this constant turbulent storm happening in his heart. And the words of Jesus keep ringing in his mind. Don't be afraid. Only believe. Only believe. Believe what, Jesus? She's dead. It's too late. Believe that nothing can stop God's plans, not even death. And nothing can stop God's plans, not even death. Jesus gets to Jairus' house. Verse 39, he tells this grieving family, the child is not dead but asleep. She was dead. Jesus says she's not dead but asleep. Here's what you got to understand, especially if you're new to the Bible, new to Christianity. Listen, to Jesus, 
death, the most final thing we could ever face in our life, death, the thing that has power over anything we could possibly do in this life. To Jesus, death is just a power nap. It, it, to, to Jesus, death has no power. He is the one that has power over it, and that is the same power he proclaims to us in the gospel. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 says, But we don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, who are dead, that you may not grieve as others do who do not have hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. The great promise of the gospel is that even though we die in this life, if we die before Jesus returns, that our sins, if we have our trust in Jesus, our sins have been forgiven. And because Jesus rose from the grave with him, our physical bodies will also be resurrected. We will be given glorified bodies and live eternally with God, this is the great proclamation of the gospel. So Jesus has authority and power over death. In verse 41, it says, he took this little girl by the hand and he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. In the original language, it's very tender language. It's like me saying to my daughter, Ava, in the morning, just going by her bedside and saying, babe, it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. And immediately, the girl gets up. There's no resuscitation. There's no delay. At the authority of his word, she stands up and begins to walk around. She was 12 years old. And at this, they were completely astonished. Completely astonished. Here's what I want you to see. Jesus wasn't running late. He was just taking his time. He was not running late. He was just taking his time. Time to do what? He was taking his time to work out his plans. To work out his plans. He didn't simply want to show his power over sickness. He wanted to demonstrate his power over death. Jairus was pursuing healing while Jesus was preparing a resurrection. And Jairus had to trade in his desires for God's plans. Listen, this is why I often say God may not give you what you want, but if you submit to his plans, he will always give you something better than what you want. Let me say that again. Let me say that again because you got to get this. Listen, God may not always give you what you want, but if you submit to his plans, he will 100% biblically guaranteed always give you something better than what you want. This is how good our God is. This is how wise our God is. He is not running late in your life. He is taking his time to work out his plans. He's not taking out his time to work out your plans. He's taking his time to work out better plans, plans that he has for you. Yes, to bring you ultimate joy. If you are in Christ, Romans 8, 28, to bring all things together for your good, but ultimately working out his plans to bring himself maximum glory. Listen, I don't know what plans you've had for your life, for your children, for your marriage, for your family, for your careers, for that dream nonprofit you want to start, for this church, for your neighborhood, the, the dreams that you have to see the glory of God spread to the nations. I don't know what those plans are. I don't know what desires and longings you've been bringing to God. And you're on that long walk like Jairus, feeling like the door has closed on those things. Let me say this to you. Number one, maybe not, because God is powerful. And he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in you. But I also want to say maybe the door is closing on that dream or that plan because God is inviting you to trade that dream in for something that he is trying to accomplish. This is the wisdom of God and we can trust it. He is not running late. He is never running late. 
And for some of us, the things that we're looking to God for, we may not even get to see in this life. But if you are in Christ, there is a day, there is a day when he will fulfill that. Listen, I was, uh, my, my wife was planning me a surprise birthday party uh, back in January 2008. It was a dope party, y'all. She was going in on this party. She invited everybody, invited family and friends and got everything set up. And so her plan was the party was going to be at my aunt's house. And the plan was she was going to come pick me up from my house. We were dating at the time. Come pick me up. And she told me we had to swing past my aunt's house to, like, get something on our way to us to, for us to just celebrate my birthday, just me and her. So she has all this p- p- plan, and she's supposed to be picking me up. And inevitably, this is the pattern, she gets the dreaded text message. I'm running late. So she's working out. It was, I was legit running late. I cut myself shaving. Like, for real. It was like Quentin Tarantino style, blood gushing out of my neck. It was terrible. All right? Like, I, re, I have pictures from that day where I just have a Band-Aid on my neck. It just, I couldn't get it to stop. It was just it was terrible. So I was legitimately running late. And so she's frustrated. She gets to the house and she's frustrated because all of her plans are kind of getting messed up. And here's what she didn't know. What she didn't know was that she wasn't planning her surprise, my surprise birthday party. She was planning her surprise engagement party. Now listen, because here's what happened. A couple months prior to that, I called my boy Delali. And I was like, listen, bro, I need you to call Ashley. I need you to convince her to plan me a surprise birthday party. Here's who I want you to invite. Here's the family and the friends I want you to invite. It's going to be at my aunt's house. (laughs) He's like, what what kind of food do you want? I was like, I don't care. Just ask her. She's the one planning it. You know what I mean? (laughs) I'm trying to give you a tip. I'm trying to give you a tip, fellas. This is how you do it. Let her plan the whole thing. Can't go wrong. She's going to love it. She planned it. (laughs) So she picks me up, hop in the car. I'm nervous and excited. She's nervous and excited. (laughs) We get to the house. We get to the door. She's trying to make me go in first. I'm trying to make her go in first. (laughs) We're just at a standstill at the door. So we walk in. Foyer is full of people. Church staff, family, friends, full of people. And she's kind of looking back and waiting for me to be surprised. And then her father walks up to her and he takes her coat so she's a little bit confused and I have a picture of her like looking confused (laughs) and there's a chair in the middle of the foyer and her father takes her to the chair and sits her down so she's like disoriented but it's all kind of beginning to come together and so I drop down on on one knee and and listen she didn't know I wasn't running late just taking my time. Just taking my time. Listen, listen. You have your plans. You may be struggling, feeling like because he's, God has delayed, that your plans are getting thrown off. Because he's delayed, that your desires are going unfulfilled telling you, if you trust Jesus, if you trust him to forgive your sins and to give you eternal life, if you trust him to be the one to lead and guide your life, if you trust him to be the one to dictate your plans and your decisions, there will be a day where just like my wife sitting in that chair started to figure it out, there will be a day when God will allow you to see that his plans are better than yours, that all along While you were frustrated about your plans, he was preparing something that you could not possibly imagine. He is wise, he is good, he is powerful, and you can trust him. You can trust him. Let me pray as we close. Father, I know I need need to hear the message here in Mark chapter 5. Because there are things in our lives, there are delays and frustrations and layoffs and divorce and sickness and pain and 
abuse. There's so many things. And then there's death, the ultimate thing that causes us to wonder, where is the power of God? Where is the wisdom of God? Where is the goodness of God? And we need to be reminded that you are still on your throne, that you are in control over everything, and there is nothing, nothing that can stop your plans. Oh, God, help us to trust you. and Help us to not fear when we're in the midst of waiting to see you be faithful to your promises and your word. Oh, Lord, you can handle our hopes and our desires. You can handle our fears. Remind us of that today. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.